Ahoy! I hope you're enjoying these readings of Kurt Vonnegut's work. This is just a reminder that I have three audiobooks available on Audible from the hilarious author Frank J. Edler. Death Gets a Book is about the kind of job training you might expect if you inadvertently become a grim reaper. Most jobs suck, but being a death can be a job worse than, well, death. A death in Toledo follows a rather unique reaper with a serious work problem, vampires. How do you claim the souls of beings that aren't quite dead? And finally, Catcoin, the fictional history of a cryptocurrency. It's about a digital currency based on cats. Literal cats. And told from the perspective of the very first cat coin, one. An adorably fluffy kitty with a serious wine drinking problem. You can find samples of these audiobooks scattered around this channel. And remember to like, subscribe, and comment. More Vonnegut is yet to come. Galapagos by Kurt Vonnegut Part 6 Book 2, Chapters 1 through 7, read by Ron Gabaldon. Book 2 And the Thing Became 1. The Thing Became a New White Motor Ship at Night, without charts or a compass or running lights, but nonetheless slitting the cold deep ocean at her maximum velocity. In the opinion of humankind, she no longer existed. The Bahia de Darwin, and not the San Mateo, in the opinion of humankind, had been blown to smithereens. She was a ghost ship, out of sight of land and carrying the genes of her captain and seven of her ten passengers westward on an adventure which has lasted one million years so far. I was the ghost of a ghost ship. I am the son of a big-brained science fiction writer, whose name was Kilgore Trout. I was a deserter from the United States Marines. I was given political asylum and then citizenship in Sweden, where I became a welder in a shipyard in Malmo. I was painlessly decapitated one day by a falling sheet of steel while working inside the hull of the Bahia de Darwin, at which time I refused to set foot in the blue tunnel leading into the afterlife. It has always been within my power to materialize, but I have done that only once, very early in the game, for a few wet and blustery moments during the storm my ship encountered in the North Atlantic during her voyage from Malmo to Guayaquil. I appeared in the crow's nest, and one Swedish member of the skeleton crew saw me up there. He had been drinking. My decapitated body was facing the stern, and my arms were upraised. In my hands, I was holding my severed head as though it were a basketball. So, I was invisible as I stood next to Captain Adolf von Kleist on the bridge of the Bahia de Darwin as we awaited the end of our first night at sea after our hasty departure from Guayaquil. He had been awake all night and was sober now, but had a terrible headache, which he had described to Mary Hepburn as a golden screw between my eyes. He had other souvenirs of the previous evening's humiliating debauch, contusions and abrasions from the several falls he had taken while trying to get up on the roof of the bus. He would never have gotten that drunk if he had realized that he was going to be saddled with any responsibilities. He had already explained that to Mary, who had been up all night too, nursing James Waite on the sun deck, abaft of the officers' cabins. Waite had been put up there with Mary's rolled-up blouse for a pillow because the rest of the ship was so dark. At least there was starlight up there after the moon went down. The plan was to move him into a cabin when the sun came up so that he would not fry to death on the bare steel plates. Everybody else was on the boat deck below. Selina McIntosh was in the main saloon, using her dog for a pillow, and so were the six Cancabono girls. They were using each other for pillows. Hisako was in the head off of the main saloon, and had fallen asleep while wedged between the toilet and the wash basin. Mandarax, which Mary had turned over to the captain, was in a drawer on the bridge. This was the only drawer on the whole ship with anything in it. It was slightly ajar so that Mandarax had overheard and translated much of what had been said during the night. Thanks to a random setting, 
It translated everything into Kyrgyz, including the captain's plan of action, which went like this. They would go straight to the Galapagos island of Baltra, where there were docking facilities and an airfield and a small hospital. There was a powerful radio station there, so they would learn for certain what the two explosions had been and how the rest of the world might be faring in case a widespread shower of meteorites had taken place or, as Mary had suggested, World War III had begun. Yes, and this plan might as well have been translated into Kyrgyz or some other language that practically nobody understood because they were on a course which was going to cause them to miss the Galapagos Islands entirely. His ignorance alone might have been enough to carry the ship far off course, but he compounded his mistakes during the first night, before he was sober, by changing course again and again in order to steer for the probable impact points in the ocean of shooting stars. His big brain, remember, had him believing that a meteorite shower was going on. Every time he saw a shooting star, he expected it to hit the ocean and cause a tidal wave. So he would steer for it in order to receive the wave on the ship's bow. When the sun came up, he could have been, thanks to his big brain, simply anywhere, and headed for simply anywhere. Mary Hepburn, meanwhile, somewhere between sleep and wakefulness, next to James Waite, was doing something people don't have brains enough to do anymore. She was reliving the past. She was a virgin again. She was in a sleeping bag. She was being awakened in the faintest light of dawn by the call of a whoopperwill. She was camping in Indiana State Park, a living museum, a patch of what the area used to be before Europeans decreed that no plant or animal would be tolerated which was not tamed and edible by humankind. When young Mary stuck her head out of her cocoon, out of her sleeping bag, she saw rotting logs and an undammed stream. She lay on an aromatic mulch of eons of death and discard. There was plenty to eat if you were a microorganism or could digest leaves, but there was no hearty breakfast there for a human being of a million and thirty years ago. It was early June. It was balmy. The bird call was coming from a thicket of briars and sumac fifty paces away. She was glad for this alarm clock, for it had been her intention when she went to sleep to awake this early and to think of her sleeping bag as a cocoon and to emerge from it sinuously and voluptuously, as she was now doing, a vivacious adult. What joy! What satisfaction! It was perfect, for the girlfriend she had brought with her slept on and on. So she stole across the springy woodland floor to the thicket to see this fellow early bird. What she saw instead was a tall, skinny, earnest young man in a sailor suit, and it was he who was whistling the piercing call of a whippoorwill. This was Roy, her future husband. She was annoyed and disoriented. The sailor suit so far inland was a particularly bizarre detail. She felt intruded upon, and that perhaps she should be frightened as well. But if this very strange person was going to come after her, he would have to get through a tangle of briars first. She had slept in her clothes, so she was fully dressed save for her stocking feet. He had heard her coming. He had amazingly sharp ears. So did his father. It was a family trait. And he spoke first. Hello, he said. Hello, she said. She would later say that she thought she was the only person in the Garden of Eden, and then she came upon this creature in a sailor suit, who was acting as though he already owned everything. And Roy would counter that she was the one, in fact, who acted as though she owned everything. What are you doing here? she said. I didn't think people were supposed to sleep in this part of the park, he said. He was right about that, and Mary knew it. She and her friend were in violation of the rules of the living museum. They were in an area where only lower animals were supposed to be at night. You're a sailor, she said. And he said that yes, he was, or had been until very recently. He had just been discharged from the Navy and was hitchhiking around the country before going home and found people were much more inclined to pick him up if he wore his uniform. It would make no sense today for somebody to ask, as Mary asked Roy, what are you doing here? 
The reasons for being anywhere today are so invariably simple and obvious. Nobody has a tale as tangled as Roy's to tell that he took his discharge in San Francisco and cashed in his ticket and bought a sleeping bag and hitchhiked to the Grand Canyon and Yellowstone National Park and some other places he had always wanted to see. He was especially fascinated by birds and could talk to them in their own languages. So he heard on a car radio that a pair of ivory-billed woodpeckers, a species believed to have been long extinct, had been sighted in this little state park in Indiana. He headed straight for there. The story would turn out to be a hoax. These big, beautiful inhabitants of primeval forest really were extinct, since human beings had destroyed all their natural habitats. No longer was there enough rotten wood and peace and quiet for them. They needed lots of peace and quiet, said Roy. And so do I. And so do you, I guess. And I'm sorry if I disturbed you. I wasn't doing anything a bird wouldn't do. Some automatic device clicked in her big brain, and her knees felt weak, and there was a chilly feeling in her stomach. She was in love with this man. They don't make memories like that anymore. 2. James Waite interrupted Mary Hepburn's reverie with these words. I love you so much. Please marry me. I'm so lonesome. I'm so scared. You save your strength, Mr. Fleming, she said. He had been proposing marriage intermittently all through the night. Give me your hand, he said. Every time I do, you won't give it back, she said. I promise I'll give it back, he said. So she gave him her hand, and he gripped it feebly. He wasn't having any visions of the future or the past. He was little more than a fibrillating heart, just as Hisako Hiraguchi, wedged between the vibrating toilet and wash basin below, was little more than a fetus and a womb. Hisako had nothing to live for but her unborn child, she thought. People still hiccup as they always have, and they still find it very funny when somebody farts. And they still try to comfort those who are sick with soothing tones of voice. Mary's tone when she kept James Waite company on the ship is a tone often heard today. With or without words, that tone conveys what a sick person wants to hear now and what Waite wanted to hear a million years ago. Mary said things like this to Waite in so many words, but her tone alone would have delivered the same message. We love you. You are not alone. Everything is going to be all right. And so on. No comforter today, of course, has led a love life as complicated as Mary Hepburn's, and no sufferer today has led a love life as complicated as James Waite's. Any human love story of today would have for its crisis the simplest of questions, whether the person involved were in heat or not. Men and women now become helplessly interested in each other and the nubbins on their flippers and so on only twice a year, or in times of fish shortages only once a year. So much depends on fish. Mary Hepburn and James Waite could have their common sense wrecked by love, given the right set of circumstances, at almost any time. There on the sun deck, just before the sun came up, Waite was genuinely in love with Mary, and Mary was genuinely in love with him, or rather, with what he claimed to be. All through the night, she had called him Mr. Fleming, and he had not asked her to call him by his first name. Why? Because he could not remember what his first name was supposed to be. I'll make you very rich, said Waite. There, there, said Mary. Now, now. Compound interest, he said. You save your strength, Mr. Fleming, she said. Please marry me, he said. We'll talk about that when we get to Baltra, she said. She had given him Baltra as something to live for. She had cooed and murmured to him all through the night about the good things which were awaiting them on Baltra, as though it were a sort of paradise. There would be saints and angels to greet them on the dock there, with every kind of food and medicine. He knew he was dying. You'll be a very rich widow, he said. Let's not have any talk like that now, she said. As for all the wealth she was going to inherit technically, since she really was going to marry him and then become his widow, the biggest brain detectives in the world couldn't have begun to find a minor fraction of it. 
In community after community, he had created a prudent citizen who didn't exist, whose wealth was increasing steadily, even though the planet itself was growing ever poorer, and whose safety was guaranteed by the governments of the United States or Canada. His savings account in Guadalajara, Mexico, which was in pesos, had been wiped out by then. If his wealth had continued to grow at the rate it was growing, then the James Waite estate would now encompass the whole universe. Galaxies, black holes, comets, clouds of asteroids and meteors, and the captain's meteorites and interstellar matter of every sort. Simply everything. Yes, and if the human population had continued to grow at the rate it was growing then, it would now outweigh the James estate, which is to say simply everything. What impossible dreams of increase human beings used to have only yesterday, a million years ago. 3. Wait had reproduced incidentally. Not only had he sent that antiques dealer down the blue tunnel into the afterlife so long ago, he had also made possible the birth of an heir. By Darwinian standards, as both a murderer and a sire, he had done quite well, one would have to say. He became a sire when he was only 16 years old, the sexual prime of a human male a million years ago. He was still in Midland City, Ohio, and it was a hot July afternoon, and he was mowing the lawn of a fabulously well-to-do automobile dealer and owner of local fast food restaurants named Dwayne Hoover, who had a wife but no children. So Mr. Hoover was in Cincinnati on business, and Mrs. Hoover, whom Waite had never seen, although he had mowed the lawn many times, was in the house. She was a recluse because, as Waite had heard, she had a problem with alcohol and drugs prescribed by her doctor, and her big brain had simply become too erratic to be trusted in public. Waite was good-looking back then. His mother and father had also been good-looking. He was from a good-looking family. Despite the fact that it was so hot, Waite would not take off his shirt because he was so ashamed of all the scars he had from punishments inflicted by various foster parents. Later, when he was a male prostitute on the island of Manhattan, his clients would find those scars, made by cigarettes and coat hangers and belt buckles and so on, very exciting. Waite was not looking for sexual opportunities. He had just about made up his mind to light out for Manhattan, but he did not want to do anything which might give the police an excuse for locking him up. He was well known to the police, who frequently questioned him about this or that burglary or whatever, although he had never committed an actual crime. The police were always watching him anyway. They would say to him things like, Sooner or later, Sonny, you're going to make a big mistake. So Mrs. Hoover appeared in the front door in a skimpy bathing suit. There was a swimming pool out back. Her face was all rattled and addled, and her teeth were bad but she still had a very beautiful figure. She asked him if he wouldn't like to come into the house, which was air-conditioned, and cool off with a glass of iced tea or lemonade. The next thing Waite knew, they were having sex in there, and she was saying they were two of a kind, both of them lost, and kissing his scars and so on. Mrs. Hoover conceived and gave birth to a son nine months later, which Mr. Hoover believed to be his own. It was a good-looking boy who would grow up to be a good dancer and very musical, just like Waite. Waite heard about the baby after he moved to Manhattan, but he could never consider it a relative. He would go years without thinking about it, and then his big brain would suddenly tell him for no good reason that somewhere in the world there was this young male walking around who wouldn't be in this world if it weren't for him. It would make him feel creepy, that was much too big a result for such a little accident. Why would he have wanted a son back then? It was the farthest thing from his mind. The sexual prime for human males today, incidentally, comes at the age of six or so. When a six-year-old comes across a female in heat, there is no stopping him from engaging in sexual intercourse. And I pity him, because I can still remember what I was like when I was 16. It was hell to be that excited. Then, as now, orgasms gave no relief. Ten minutes after an orgasm, guess what? Nothing would do but that you have another one. And there was homework besides. 4. 
These people on the Bahia de Darwin weren't uncomfortably hungry yet. Everybody's intestines, including those of Kazakh, were still wringing the last of the digestible molecules from what they had eaten the previous afternoon. Nobody was consuming parts of his or her own body yet, the survival scheme of the Galapagos tortoises. The Cancabonos certainly knew what hunger was already. For the rest, it would be a discovery. And the only two people who had to keep their strength up and not just sleep all the time were Mary Hepburn and the captain. The Cancabono girls understood nothing about the ship or the ocean and could make no sense of anything that was said to them in any language but Cancabono. Hisako was catatonic, Selena was blind, and Waite was dying. That left only two people to steer the ship and care for weight. During the first night, those two would agree that Mary should steer during the daytime when the sun would tell her unambiguously which way was east, from which they were fleeing, and which way was west, where the supposed peace and plenty of Baltra lay. And the captain would navigate by the stars at night. Whoever wasn't steering would have to keep weight company and presumably would catch some sleep while doing so. These were certainly long watches to stand. Then again, this was to be a very brief ordeal since, according to the captain's calculations, Baltra was only about 40 hours from Guayaquil. If they had ever reached Baltra, which they never did, they would have found it devastated and depopulated by yet another air-mailed package of Dagonite. Human beings were so prolific back then that conventional explosions like that had few, if any, long-term biological consequences. Even at the end of protracted wars, there still seemed to be plenty of people around. Babies were always so plentiful that serious efforts to reduce the population by means of violence were doomed to failure. They no more left permanent injuries except for the nuclear attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki than did the Bahia de Darwin as it slit and roiled the trackless sea. It was humanity's ability to heal so quickly by means of babies, which encouraged so many people to think of explosions as show business, as highly theatrical forms of self-expression, and little more. What humanity was about to lose, though, except for one tiny colony on Santa Rosalia, was what the trackless sea could never lose, so long as it was made of water, the ability to heal itself. As far as humanity was concerned, all wounds were about to become very permanent, and high explosives weren't going to be a branch of show business anymore. Yes, and if humanity had continued to heal its self-inflicted wounds by means of copulation, then the tale I have to tell about the Santa Rosalia colony would be a tragicomedy starring the vain and incompetent Captain Adolf von Kleist. It would have spanned months rather than a million years, since the colonists would never have become colonists. They would have been marooned persons who were noticed and rescued in a little while. Among them would have been a shame-faced captain, solely responsible for their travail. After only one night at sea, though, the captain was still able to believe that all was well. It would soon be time for Mary Hepburn to relieve him at the wheel, at which time he would give her these instructions. Keep the sun over the stern all morning and over the bow all afternoon. And the captain saw as his most pressing task the earning of his passengers' respect. They had seen him at his very worst. By the time they docked at Baltra, he hoped, they would have forgotten his drunkenness and would be telling one and all that he had saved their lives. That was another thing people used to be able to do, which they can't do anymore. Enjoy in their heads events which hadn't occurred yet and which might never occur. My mother was good at that. Someday my father would stop writing science fiction and write something a whole lot of people wanted to read instead, and we would get a new house in a beautiful city and nice clothes and so on. She used to make me wonder why God had ever gone to all the trouble of creating reality. Quoth Mandarax Imagination is as good as many voyages, and how much cheaper! George William Curtis, 1824-1892 So there the captain was, half-naked on the bridge of the Bahia de Darwin, 
but in his head, he was on the island of Manhattan, where most of his money and so many of his friends were anyway. He was going to get there somehow from Baltra and buy himself a nice apartment on Park Avenue and the hell with Ecuador. Reality intruded now. The very real sun was coming up. There was one small trouble with the sun. The captain had imagined all night that he was sailing due west, which meant that the sun would be rising squarely astern. This particular sun, however, was astern all right, but also very much starboard. So he turned the ship to port until the sun was where it was supposed to be. His big brain, which was responsible for the error he corrected, assured his soul that its mistake was minor and very recent, and had happened because the stars were dimmed by dawn. His big brain wanted the respect of his soul as much as he wanted the respect of his passengers. His brain had a life of its own, and the time would come when he would actually try to fire it for having misled him. But that time was still five days away. He still trusted it when he went aft to learn how Willard Fleming was and to help Mary, according to plan, move him into the shade of the gangway between the officers' cabins. I do not put a star before the name of Willard Fleming since there wasn't really such an individual, so he couldn't die. And the captain was so uninterested in Mary Hepburn as a person that he did not even know her last name. He thought it was Kaplan the name over the pocket of her war surplus fatigue blouse, which Waite was using for a pillow now. Waite believed her last name to be Kaplan too, no matter how often she corrected him. During the night, he had said to her, You Jews sure are survivors. She had replied, You're a survivor too, Willard. Well, he had said, I used to think I was one, Mrs. Kaplan. Now I'm not so sure. I guess everybody who isn't dead yet is a survivor. Now, now, she had said. You're a survivor too, Willard. Now, now, she had said. Let's talk about something pleasant. Let's talk about Baltra. But the blood supply to his brain must have been momentarily dependable then, because Waite had continued to follow this line of reasoning. He'd even given a little dry laugh. He said... There are all these people bragging about how they're survivors, as though that's something special. But the only kind of person who can't say that is a corpse. There, there, she'd said. When the captain appeared before Mary and Waite before sunrise, Mary had just consented to marry Waite. He had worn her down. It was as though he had been begging for water all night, so that finally she was going to give him some. If he wanted betrothal so badly, and betrothal was all she had to give him, then she would give him some. She did not expect, however, to have to honor that pledge almost immediately, or perhaps ever. She certainly liked all he had told her about himself. During the night, he had discovered that she was a cross-country skiing enthusiast. He had responded warmly that he was never happier than when he was on skis, with the clean snow all around and the silence of the frozen lakes and forests. He had never been on skis in his life, but had once married and ruined the widow of an owner of a ski lodge in the White Mountains in New Hampshire. He courted her in the springtime and left her a pauper before the green leaves turned orange and yellow and red and brown. This wasn't a human being Mary was engaged to. She had a pastiche for a fiancé. Not that it mattered much what she was engaged to, her big brain told her, since they certainly couldn't get married before they got to Baltra, and Willard Fleming, if he was still alive, would have to go to intensive care immediately. There was plenty of time, she thought, for her to back out of the engagement. So it did not seem a particularly serious matter when Waite said to the captain, I have the most wonderful news. Mrs. Kaplan is going to marry me. I am the luckiest man in the world. Fate now played a trick on Mary almost as quick and logical as my decapitation in the shipyard at Malmo. You are in luck, said the captain. As captain of this ship in international waters, I am legally entitled to marry you. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today in the sight of God, he began, and two minutes later, he had made Mary Kaplan and Willard Fleming man and wife. 5. Quoth Mandarax 
Oaths are but words, and words but wind. Samuel Butler, 1612-1680 And Mary Hepburn on Santa Rosalia would memorize that quotation from Mandarax and hundreds of others, but as the years went by, she took her marriage to Willard Fleming more and more seriously, even though this second husband had died with a smile on his face about two minutes after the captain pronounced them man and wife. She would say to Furry Akiko when she was an old, old lady bent over and toothless, I thank God for sending me two good men. She meant Roy and Willard Fleming. It was her way of saying, too, that she did not think much of the captain, who was then an old, old man and the father or grandfather of all the island's young people, save for Akiko. Akiko was the only young person in the colony eager to hear stories, and particularly love stories about life on the mainland, so that Mary would apologize to her for having so few first-person love stories to tell. Her parents had certainly been very much in love, she said, and Akiko enjoyed hearing about how they were still kissing and hugging each other right up to the end. Mary could make Akiko laugh about the ridiculous love affair, if you could call it that, she had had with a widower named Robert Wojciechowicz, who was head of the English department at Ilium High School before the school closed down. He was the only person besides Roy and Willard Fleming who had ever proposed marriage to her. The story went like this. Robert Wojciechowicz started calling her up and asking her for dates only two weeks after Roy was buried. She turned him down and let him know that it was certainly too early for her to start dating again. She did everything she could to discourage him, but he came to see her one afternoon anyway, even though she had said she very much wished to be alone. He drove up to her house while she was mowing the lawn. He made her shut off the mower, and then he blurted out a marriage proposal. Mary would describe his car to Akiko and make Akiko laugh about it, even though Akiko had never seen and never would see any sort of automobile. Robert Wojciechowicz drove a Jaguar, which used to be very beautiful, but which was now all scored and dented on the driver's side. The car was a gift from his wife while she was dying. Her name was Doris, a name Akiko would give to one of her furry daughters, simply because of Mary's story. Doris Wojciechowicz had inherited a little money, and she bought the Jaguar for her husband as a way of thanking him for having been such a good husband. They had a grown son named Joseph, and he was a lout, and he wrecked the beautiful Jaguar while his mother was still alive. Joseph was sent to jail for a year, as a punishment for operating a motor vehicle while under the influence of alcohol. There is our brain-shrinking old friend alcohol again. Robert's marriage proposal took place on the only freshly mowed lawn in the neighborhood. All the other yards were being recaptured by wilderness, since everybody else had moved away, and the whole time Wojciechowicz was proposing, a big golden retriever was barking at them and pretending to be dangerous. This was Donald, the dog who had been such a comfort to Roy during the last months of his life. Even dogs had names back then. Donald was the dog, Robert was the man, and Donald was harmless. He had never bitten anybody. All he wanted was for someone to throw a stick for him so he could bring it back, so somebody could throw a stick for him, so he could bring it back, and so on. Donald wasn't very smart, to say the least. He certainly wasn't going to write Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. When Donald slept, he would often whimper and his hind legs would shiver. He was dreaming of chasing sticks. Robert was frightened of dogs because he and his mother had been attacked by a Doberman Pinscher when Robert was only five years old. Robert was all right with dogs as long as there was somebody around who knew how to control them, but whenever he was alone with one, no matter what size it was, he sweated and trembled, and his hair stood on end. So he was extremely careful to avoid such situations. But his marriage proposal so surprised Mary Hepburn that she burst into tears, something nobody does anymore. She was so embarrassed and confused that she apologized to him brokenly, and she ran into the house. She didn't want to be married to anybody but Roy. Even if Roy was dead, she still didn't want to be married to anybody but Roy. 
So that left Robert all alone on the front lawn with Donald. If Robert's big brain had been any good, it would have had him walk deliberately to his car while telling Donald scornfully to shut up and go home and so on. But it had him turn and run instead. His brain was so defective that it had him run right past his car, with Donald loping right behind him, and he crossed the street and climbed an apple tree in the front yard of an empty house, belonging to a family which had moved to Alaska. So Donald sat under the tree and barked up at him. Robert was up there for an hour, afraid to come down, until Mary, wondering why Donald had been barking so monotonously for so long, came out of her house and rescued him. When Robert came down, he was nauseated by fear and self-loathing. He actually threw up. After that, and he had spattered his own shoes and pants cuffs, he said snarlingly, I am not a man. I am simply not a man. I will, of course, never bother you again. I will never bother any woman ever again. And I retell this story of Mary's at this point because... Captain Adolf von Kleist would hold the same low opinion of his worth after churning the ocean to a lather for five days and nights and failing to find an island of any kind. He was too far north, much too far north. So we were all too far north, much too far north. I wasn't hungry, of course, and neither was James Waite, who was frozen solid in the meat locker in the galley below. The galley, although stripped of light bulbs and without portholes, could still be illuminated, albeit hellishly, by the heating elements of its electric ovens and stoves. Yes, and the plumbing was still working too. There was plenty of water on tap everywhere, both hot and cold. So nobody was thirsty, but everybody was surely ravenous. Kazak, Selina's dog, was missing, and I put no star before her name, for Kazak was dead. The Kankabono girls had stolen her while Selina slept and choked her with their bare hands and skinned and gutted her with no other tools than their teeth and fingernails. They had roasted her in an oven. Nobody else knew that they had done that yet. She had been consuming her own substance anyway. By the time they killed her, she was skin and bones. If she had made it to Santa Rosalia, she wouldn't have had much of a future even in the unlikely event that there had been a male dog there. She had been neutered, after all. All she could have accomplished, which might have outlasted her own lifetime, would have been to give the furry Akiko, soon to be born, infantile memories of a dog. Under the best of circumstances, Kazak would not have lived long enough for the other children born on the island to pet her, and to see her wag her tail and so on. They wouldn't have had her bark to remember, since Kazak never barked. 6. I say now of Kazak's untimely death, lest anyone should be moved to tears. Oh well, she wasn't going to write Beethoven's Ninth Symphony anyway. I say the same thing about the death of James Waite. Oh well, he wasn't going to write Beethoven's Ninth Symphony anyway. This wry comment on how little most of us were likely to accomplish in life, no matter how long we lived, isn't my own invention. I first heard it spoken in Swedish at a funeral while I was still alive. The corpse at this particular rite of passage was an obtuse and unpopular shipyard foreman named Per Olaf Rosenquist. He had died young, or what was thought to be young in those days, because he, like James Waite, had inherited a defective heart. I went to the funeral with a fellow welder named Hjalmar Arvid Bolström. Not that it can matter much what anybody's name was a million years ago. As we left the church, Bostrom said to me, Oh well, he wasn't going to write Beethoven's Ninth Symphony anyway. I asked him if this black joke was original, and he said no, that he had heard it from his German grandfather, who had been an officer in charge of burying the dead on the Western Front during World War I. It was common for soldiers new to that sort of work to wax philosophical over this corpse or that one, into whose face he was about to shovel dirt, speculating about what he might have done if he hadn't died so young. There were many cynical things a veteran might say to such a thoughtful recruit, and one of those was, Don't worry about it. He wasn't going to write Beethoven's Ninth Symphony anyway. 
After myself was buried young in Malmo, only six meters from Per Olaf Rosenquist, Hjalmar Arvid Bolstrom said that about me as he left the cemetery. Oh well, Leon wasn't going to write Beethoven's Ninth Symphony anyway. Yes, and I was reminded of that comment when Captain von Kleist chided Mary for weeping about the death of the man they believed to be Willard Fleming. They had been out to sea for only twelve hours then, and the captain still felt easily superior to her, and, for that matter, to practically everyone. He said to her, while he told her how to hold the ship on its western course, What a waste of time to cry about a total stranger. From what you tell me, he had no relatives and was no longer engaged in any useful work, so what is there to cry about? That might have been a good time for me to say as a disembodied voice, He certainly wasn't going to write Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. He made a sort of joke now, but it didn't really sound like much of a joke. As captain of this ship, he said, I order you to cry only when there is something to cry about. There is nothing to cry about now. He was my husband, she said. I choose to take that ceremony you performed very seriously. You can laugh if you want. Waite was right out back on the subject still. He hadn't been put in the freezer yet. He gave a lot to this world, and he still had a lot to give. If only we could have saved him. What did this man give to the world that was so wonderful? asked the captain. He knew more about windmills than anybody alive, she said. He said we could close down the coal mines and the uranium mines, that windmills alone could make the coldest parts of the world as warm as Miami, Florida. He was also a composer. Really? said the captain. Yes, she said. He wrote two symphonies. I found that piquant. In view of what I have just been saying, that Waite, during his last night on Earth, should have claimed to have written two symphonies, Mary went on to say that when she got back home, she was going to go to Moose Jaw and find those symphonies, which had never been performed, and try to get an orchestra to give them a premiere. Willard was such a modest man, she said. So it would seem, said the captain. One hundred and eight hours later, the captain would find himself in direct competition with the reputation of this modest paragon. If only Willard were still alive, she said, he would know exactly what to do. The captain had wholly lost his self-respect, and although he had thirty more years to live, would never get it back again. How is that for a real tragedy? He was abject in the face of Mary's mockery. I am certainly open to suggestions, he said. You have only to tell me what the wonderful Willard would have done, and that is what I will most gladly do. He had by then fired his brain, and was navigating on the advice of his soul alone, turning the ship this way and then that way. An island the size of a handkerchief would have inspired the captain to sob in gratitude. And yes, yet again the sun, now dead ahead, now to port, now astern, now to starboard, was going down. On the deck below, Selina McIntosh was calling for her dog. Kazak! Kazak! Has anybody seen my dog? Mary yelled back, She's not up here. And then, trying to imagine what Willard would have done, she came up with the idea that Mandarax, along with being a clock and translator and so on, might also be a radio. She told the captain to try to call for help with it. The captain didn't know the instrument was a mandarax. He thought it was a gokubi, and he had a gokubi in his handkerchief drawer, along with some cufflinks and shirt studs and watches, in his house back in Quito. His brother had given it to him the previous Christmas, but he hadn't found it useful. To him, it was just another toy, and he knew this much about it, that it certainly was not a radio. Now he weighed what he thought was a gokubi in his hand, and he said to Mary, I would give my right arm to have this piece of junk be a radio. I promise you, though, not even the saintly Willard Fleming could send or receive a message with a gokubi. Maybe it's time you stopped being so absolutely certain about so much, said Mary. That thought has occurred to me, he said. Then send an SOS, said Mary. What harm can it do? No harm, surely, said the captain, 
Mrs. Fleming, you are absolutely right. It can surely do no harm. He spoke into the tiny microphone of Mandarax, saying the international word for a ship in distress a million years ago. Mayday! 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 He intoned. He then held the screen of Mandarax so that he and Mary might both read any reply which might appear there. As it happened, they had tapped into that part of the instrument's intellect, lacking in Gokubi, which knew so many quotations on every conceivable subject, including the month of May. On the little screen, these utterly mystifying words appeared. In depraved May, dogwood and chestnut, flowering Judas. To be eaten to be divided, to be drunk among whispers. T.S. Eliot, 1888-1965 7. The captain and Mary were able to believe for a moment that they had made contact with the outside world, although no response to an SOS could have come that fast and been so literary. So the captain called again, Mayday! Mayday! This is the Bahia de Darwin calling. Position unknown. Do you read me? To which Mandarax replied, May will be fine next year, as like as not. Oh, A, but then we shall be 24. A. E. Hausman, 1859-1936 So then it was evident that the word may was triggering quotations from the instrument itself. The captain puzzled over this. He still believed he had a Gokubi, but that it might be slightly more sophisticated than the one he had at home. Little did he know. He caught on that he was getting responses to the word May. So then he tried June, and Mandarax replied, June is busting out all over. Oscar Hammerstein II, 1895-1960 October, October, cried the captain, and Mandarax replied, the skies they were ashen and sober, the leaves they were crisped and sere, the leaves they were withering and sere. It was night in the lonesome October of my most immemorial year. Edgar Allan Poe, 1809 to 1849. So that was that for Mandarax, which the captain still believed to be a Gokubi. And Mary said that she might as well go back up into the crow's nest to see what she could see. Before she went up there, though, she had one more barb for the captain. She asked him to name the island she might expect to see very soon. This was something he had done all through the third day at sea, naming islands which were just below the horizon and dead ahead, supposedly. Keep your eyes peeled for San Cristobal, or maybe Genovese, depending on how far south we are, he had said, or later in the day. Ah, I know where we are now. At any moment, we will be seeing Hood Island, the only nesting place in the world for the waved albatross, the largest bird in the archipelago, and so on. Those albatrosses, incidentally, are still around today and still nesting on Hood. They have wing spreads as great as two meters and remain as committed as ever to the future of aviation. They still think it's the coming thing. As the fifth day drew to a close, though, the captain remained silent when Mary asked him to name any island he believed to be nearby. So she asked him again, and he told her this, Mount Ararat. When she got up into the crow's nest, though, I was surprised that she did not cry out in wonderment at what I mistook for a very queer weather phenomenon taking place right over the stern of the ship and then trailing aft over the wake. It seemed electrical in nature, although very silent, a close relative of ball lightning, maybe, or St. Elmo's fire. That former high school teacher looked right at it, but gave no sign that she found it at all out of the ordinary. And then I understood that only I could see it, and so knew it for what it was. The blue tunnel into the afterlife. It had come after me again. I had seen it three times before, at the moment of my decapitation, and then at the cemetery in Malmo, when Swedish clay was thumping wetly on the lid of my coffin, and Hjalmar Arvid Bostrom, who was certainly never going to write Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, said of me, Oh well, he wasn't going to write Beethoven's Ninth Symphony anyway. 
Its third appearance was when I myself was up in the crow's nest, during a storm in the North Atlantic, in the sleet and spray, holding my severed head on high as though it were a basketball. The question the blue tunnel implies by appearing is one only I can answer. Have I at last exhausted my curiosity as to what life is all about? If so, I need only step inside what I liken to a vacuum cleaner. If there is indeed suction within the blue tunnel, which is filled with a light much like that cast off by the electric stoves and ovens of the Bahia de Darwin, it does not seem to trouble my late father, the science fiction writer Kilgore Trout, who can stand right in the nozzle and chat with me. The first thing father said to me from above the stern of the Bahia de Darwin was this. Had enough of the ship of fools, my boy? You come to Papa right now. Turn me down this time, and you won't see me again for a million years. A million years. My God, a million years. He wasn't fooling. As bad a father as he had been, he had always kept his promises, and he had never knowingly lied to me. So I took one step in his direction, but not a second one. I was like a female blue-footed booby at the start of a courtship dance. As in a courtship dance, that uncertain first step was the first tick of a clock, which would become irresistible. Already I was changed, although I was still a long way from the nozzle. The throbbing of the Bahia de Darwin's engines became fainter, and the steel sun deck became transparent, so that I could see into the main saloon below, where the Cancabono girls were gnawing the bones of their innocent sister, Kazak. That first step toward my father made me think this about the Indian girls and Mary up in the crow's nest to my back, and Hisako Hiraguchi and her fetus in the lavatory, and the demoralized captain and the blind Selina on the bridge, and the corpse in the walk-in freezer. Why should I ever have cared about these strangers, these slaves of fear and hunger, what do they have to do with me? When I failed to take a second step in his direction, my father said, Keep moving, Leon. No time to be coy. But I haven't completed my research, I protested. I had chosen to be a ghost because the job carried with it, as a fringe benefit, license to read minds, to learn the truth of people's pasts, to see through walls, to be many places all at once to learn in depth how this or that situation had come to be structured as it was, and to have access to all human knowledge. Father, I said, give me five more years. Five years? he exclaimed. He mocked me with the three previous bargains I had made with him. Just one more day, Dad. Just one more month, Daddy. Just six more months, Pop. But I'm learning so much about what life is really like how it really works, what it's really all about, I said. Don't lie to me, he said. Did I ever lie to you? No, sir, I said. Then don't lie to me, he said. Are you a god now, I said. No, he said. I am still nothing but your father, Leon. But don't lie to me. For all your eavesdropping, you've accumulated nothing but information. You might as well be a collector of baseball cards or bottle caps. For the sense you can make of all the information you have now, you might as well be Mandarax. Just five more years, Daddy. Dad? Father? Pa? I said. Not nearly enough time for you to learn what you hope to learn, he said. And that, my boy is why I give you my word of honor. If you send me away now, I won't be back for a million years. Leon, 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 he implored. The more you learn about people, the more disgusted you'll become. I would have thought that you're being sent by the wisest men in your country, supposedly, to fight a nearly endless, thankless, horrifying, and finally pointless war would have given you sufficient insight into the nature of humanity to last you all eternity. Need I tell you that these same wonderful animals, of which you apparently still want to learn more and more, 
are at this very moment proud as punch to have weapons in place, all set to go at a moment's notice, guaranteed to kill everything? Need I tell you that this once beautiful and nourishing planet, when viewed from the air, now resembles the diseased organs of poor Roy Hepburn when exposed at his autopsy, that the apparent cancers growing for the sake of growth alone and consuming all and poisoning all are the cities of your beloved human beings. Need I tell you that these animals have made such a botch of things that they can no longer imagine decent lives for their own grandchildren even, and will consider it a miracle if there is anything left to eat or enjoy by the year 2000, now only 14 years away. Like the people on this accursed ship, my boy, they are led by captains who have no charts or compasses, and who deal from minute to minute with no problem more substantial than how to protect their self-esteem. As in life, he still needed a shave. As in life, he was still pale and haggard. As in life, he was still smoking a cigarette. And one reason, surely, that I found it hard to take another step in his direction was that I did not like him. I had run away from home when I was sixteen because I was so ashamed of him. If there had been an angel in the mouth of the blue tunnel instead of my father, I might have skipped right in. James Waite ran away from home because people were inflicting physical pain on him all the time. He might as well have gone straight from the delivery room to the Spanish Inquisition. So ingenious were some of the tortures the big brains of foster parents had devised for him. I ran away from a real parent who had never once in anger laid a hand on me. But when I was too young to know any better, my father had made me his co-conspirator in driving my mother away forever. He had me jeering along with him at mother for wanting to take a trip somewhere, to make some friends, and to have them over for dinner, to go to a movie or a restaurant sometime. I agreed with my father. I then believed that he was the greatest writer in the world, since that was all I could think to be proud of. We had no friends, and ours was the shabbiest house in the neighborhood, and we didn't even own a television set or an automobile. So why wouldn't I have defended him against my mother? To his credit, anyway, he never suggested that he might have greatness. When I was green in judgment, though, I found greatness implied in his insistence on doing nothing but writing and smoking all the time. And I mean all the time. Oh, yes, and there was one other thing I could be proud of, and this really counted for something in Cohoas. My father had been a United States Marine. When I got to be 16, though, I myself had arrived at the conclusion my mother and the neighbors had reached so long ago that my father was a repellent failure, his work appearing only in the most disreputable publications, which paid him almost nothing. He was an insult to life itself, I thought, when he went on doing nothing with it but writing and smoking all the time. And I mean all the time. I was then flunking every course but art at school. Nobody flunked art at Cohoes High School. That was simply impossible and I ran away to find my mother, which I never did. Father had published more than a hundred books and a thousand short stories, but in all my travels I met only one person who had ever heard of him. Encountering such a person after so long a search was so confusing to me emotionally that I think I actually went crazy for a little while. I never telephoned father or dropped him so much as a postcard, I did not know he had died until I myself had died, and he appeared to me for the first time at the mouth of the blue tunnel into the afterlife. Yet I had honored him for the one thing I thought he had to be proud of still. I, too, had been a United States Marine. It was a family tradition. And by golly, if I haven't now become a writer, too, scribbling away like father, without the slightest hint that there might actually be a reader somewhere. There isn't one. There can't be one. So now we have both been like courting blue-footed boobies, doing what we had to do, whether there was anybody to notice, or, far more likely, not. Now, Father said to me from the nozzle, You're just like your mother. 
In what way? I said. You know what her favorite quotation was? He said. I certainly did, and so did Mandarax. It is the epigraph of this book. You believe that human beings are good animals who will eventually solve all their problems and make Earth into a Garden of Eden again. Could I see her, please? I said. I knew she was somewhere at the other end of the tunnel, that she was dead. That was the first thing I had asked Father after I myself was dead. Do you know what became of Mother? I had searched everywhere for her before joining the United States Marines. Is that Mother right behind you? I said. The blue tunnel was in a restless state of peristalsis. Its squirms often afforded me glimpses deep into its interior. I saw this woman in there. That third time father appeared, and I thought it might be mother. But no such luck. It's Naomi Tharp, Leon, the woman called out to me. She was the neighbor woman who, after my real mother left, did her best to be my mother for a little while. It's Mrs. Tharp, she called. You remember me, don't you, Leon? You come in here just like you used to come in through my kitchen door. Be a good boy now. You don't want to be left out there for another million years. I took another step toward the nozzle. The Bahia de Darwin became a fantasia of cobwebs. The blue tunnel became as substantial and sensible a means of transportation as the Malmo streetcar, which used to take me to and from the shipyard every day. But then, behind me, from up in the Bahia de Darwin's gossamer crow's nest, I heard the dim spook which Mary had become, shouting something over and over again. She was in agony of some sort, I thought. I could not make out her words, but her tone would have been appropriate if she had been shot in the stomach. I had to know what she was saying, and so I took two steps backwards, and then turned and looked up at her. She was sobbing. She was laughing. She was bent over the rim of the steel bucket, so that her head was upside down as she shouted to the captain on the bridge, Land ho! Land ho! Praise God, dear God! Land ho! Land!